greatest explorer in history. To many, he will be a hero. To others, a villain. He is Captain James Cook. The new lands he's charted and the oceans he's crossed have added a third of the world to the map. It's been a massive effort, and it's taken its toll. But history doesn't tell the whole story. I've been on a journey of my own to uncover the man behind the myth. To find out what drove this obsessive, discovering genius. After his shocking death in Hawaii, Cook the Man became Cook the Legend. He was fated, transformed into an icon of the British Empire. In the years that followed, the Cook industry spun into action, peddling propaganda as official history. The man himself was lost. The summer of 1776 finds James Cook here, ensconced at Greenwich Hospital, a retirement home for sailors. He's promoted to post captain. It's a short step from being an admiral, but he's bored. He's all but retired. My fate drives me from one extreme to another. A few months ago, the old southern hemisphere was hardly big enough for me. And now, I'm going to be confined within the limits of Greenwich Hospital. It's a fine retreat and a pretty income, but whether I can bring myself to lag ease and retirement, only time will show. You can sense the building frustration in his words. He hates his retirement. He knows he's the greatest explorer the world's ever seen, and the tension of being stuck here must be driving him mad. He's hurrying to make a dinner appointment, and he's taking his tension with him. He's thinking about the last great geographical mystery on Earth, and it's got a lot to do with this cup of tea. The British have always loved their tea. In 1776, they're importing more than 4,500 tons of it, mostly from China. Trouble is, getting there. trade route to the riches of the Far East is around the bottom of Africa and across the Indian Ocean. But the Portuguese have controlled that for almost 300 years. The answer is to go another way, over the top of the world. A passage northwest from Britain, up through the Arctic, down into the Pacific, and round to China, cutting the distance by almost half. Like the great southern unknown, the Northwest Passage um, was one of those great cartographic mysteries. What happened in the northern coastline of Canada? What was there at the North Pole? The search for this holy grail has brought James Cook to a high-powered dinner. He's been asked to plan an expedition to find the fabled passage. This map of the time shows the dream, a clear way across North America. But as Cook knows, not all maps tell the truth. The dinner James Cook is hurrying to is with the three most important men in the British Navy. Each one is everything James Cook isn't. Wealthy, aristocratic, titled. Everything he wants to be. Sir Hugh Palliser, controller of the Admiralty, a longtime supporter of James Cook and a friend. Sir Philip Stevens, first secretary, another friend. The Earl of Sandwich, first lord of the Admiralty. He's presided over the Navy while James Cook has added a third to the world map. The 
these men have one thing in common. They've all been drawn to this phenomenon called James Cook. He's made them look good. They've asked him to dinner to help choose the commander for the voyage to find the Northwest Passage. The conversation drags on and still no one can agree on the right man. At last, James Cook can't bear it any longer. He stands up and declares, I will undertake the direction of this enterprise if I am so commanded. It's what the Admiralty Lords were hoping for all along. Britain's discovering genius has just come out of retirement. Cook could have spent the rest of his life happily in Greenwich, um, being revered and visited and increasingly a celebrity. I don't think that sort of future was attractive for him. James Cook already has fame and reputation. Cook's old friend Joseph Banks commissions a portrait by noted artist Nathaniel Dance. It's the image of James Cook most of us recognize. The glossy imperial hero. His extraordinary talent had earned him the title of captain, but it wouldn't give him the status on land he so desperately wanted for himself and his family. Working class boys who wanted knighthoods had to work miracles, but they also needed money, and there was a £20,000 reward for finding the Northwest Passage. But he seemed to have forgotten his failing health and temper on the last voyage and that this would be no easy journey. James Cook is under enormous pressure. He has only a few months to prepare. He scours the existing charts and accounts of previous voyages, but most of them are useless fantasies. It's a sign of trouble to come. Look at the quality of information he has to deal with. This Russian map purports to be a very accurate little map but just look here, Alaska is shown as an island. This strait doesn't even exist, yet Cook's been sent north to sail through it and find the Northwest Passage. He was also rewriting and overseeing the publication of his second voyage journal. This is the age of the first great travel books. They're selling more copies than the Bible. His adventures were legendary. The Empress of Russia, the King of England, everybody wanted to read where Cook had been and what he'd found. Uh, his reputation was manipulated and forged by a countless number of, of writers, of, of painters, of poets and artists, whether in grand canvas portraits or poetic tributes. London's theatre district, and an example from six years into the future of just how big Cook's media profile would become. In December 1785, the hottest ticket in London was here in Covent Garden. It was a pantomime. Oh my, or a trip round the world. An illustration of importance to the mature mind of an adult and delightful to the tender capacity of an infant. By 1785, Cook was long dead, but he was so famous, it didn't matter. The pantomime, oh my, or a trip around the world, is about a young man from Tahiti, a place so exotic in the 18th century imagination that it represented the sum of all fantasies. Omai was brought to London in 1774 on board the Adventure, James Cook's sister ship, on his second voyage around the world. His real name was Mai, the British added the O. London couldn't get enough of him. He was sexy, exotic, erotic. He was even presented to King George III. The pantomime was spectacle, fun, propaganda, a bit of imperial spin, and the punters loved it. In the big canoe, I o'er ocean swim me. Jack and Mary crew, give good liquor to me. Then to London come. What you think of that? 
Back in 1776, James Cook's real journey to find the Northwest Passage needs to be kept secret from Britain's rivals. The rest of the world thinks Cook is taking Mai back home to Tahiti. But there are worrying signs that James Cook's third great voyage will have its problems. He wasn't doing something he'd always done was to check personally the ship, the supplies, and the equipment for the voyage. He's neglecting the very thing that ensured his success on his other voyages. The day before he sails, James Cook prepares his will. He says farewell to Elizabeth. Once again, she knows she faces years of separation. But even she can't guess it'll be 56 years of being alone. They'll never see each other again. X, the expedition sets sail. Once again, Cook uses two ships. Resolution, which he'll command, and Discovery, commanded by his close friend, the brilliant and roguish Charles Clark. James Cook's reputation and brilliance to date make him a magnet to his men. His officers and crew keep coming back for more. Charles Clark, captain of the Discovery, and half a dozen others will have sailed on all three of Cook's historic voyages. It's the second for the young and adventurous George Vancouver, who jumped on the bowsprit in the Antarctic, thereby claiming to have made it further south than anybody else. He'll famously continue Cook's work charting the Canadian coast. One of its most important cities will be named after him. One newcomer is ship's master, the brilliant but prickly William Blythe. He'll become notorious for the mutiny on the bounty, but for now, he wants to sail with Cook, the great navigator. That lineage just goes on and on, that professional navigational expertise that Cook creates and transmits. It continues to be processed through Royal Navy surveying officers right through into the 20th century. There's that lineage. Once again, James Cook is on a voyage to the other side of the world. It takes eight months hard sailing to reach New Zealand in February 1777. Queen Charlotte Sound is one of his favorite anchorages, but this time James Cook will be asked to kill someone. Three years earlier, on his second great voyage, there had been a massacre here. Mari had killed and eaten 11 crew from Cook's sister ship, Adventure. A chief named Kahura was said to be responsible. Now Cook's men and other Mari want revenge. They want Kahura dead. Some of them importuned me to kill him. But if I'd followed the advice of all our pretended friends, I might have explorated the old race. For the people of each hamlet or village, by turns, applied to me to destroy the other. Cook keeps his head and lets Kahura live. You can just imagine the bewilderment on shore and the butterings below deck. So why did he do it? Well, we know from his journals that he believed the men of the adventure were at least partly to blame for their own deaths. In fact, he says of the Maori here, in favor of these people, I find them no wickeder than other men. This is Cook, the experienced commander, at his wisest and most restrained. Even though Cook encountered violence and inflicted violence, there was that sense of the warrior ethic, which he, after all, a member of the armed forces, valued. But as the voyage develops, Cook undergoes a dramatic and disturbing change. 
he loses his temper, he starts to shout and yell at the officers and men, he starts to lose control of his emotions, and there's a, there's a kind of tragic inevitability that it's not going to end well. James Cook does have big problems. He's battling the wind and supplies are stretched to the limit. He's also missed the northern summer, which means extending the trip by another year. The cook of old would have maintained his composure. This new cook has a mean streak, and he takes it out on others. Captain Cook punished, in a manner rather unbecoming of a European, by cutting off their ears. Firing at them with small shot as they were swimming or paddling to shore. Beating them with the oars and sticking the boat hook into them. George Gilbert, midshipman, HMS Resolution. The island of Maria near Tahiti. The locals steal the ship's goat. James Cook's so angry, he sets fire to their boats and village in revenge. He writes, Thus, this troublesome and rather unfortunate affair ended, which could not be more regretted on the part of the natives than it was on mine. His journal shows us he was aware of his behaviour, but couldn't stop it. For a control freak like Cook, this must have been terrifying. Actually, I sometimes wonder if he just wasn't a little bit depressed, because depression wasn't a condition that one admitted to or diagnosed back in the 1700s. Another more simple explanation might be that he just wore the burden of command for too long. He was worn down by continual responsibility. Cook's wild mood swings continue. There are places the old Cook reappears, but ironically, they're on land, not at sea. In August 1777, James Cook lands in Tahiti for the fourth time. Nations, warriors, chiefs, now. The first part of his job is done. He's brought my home. But to what? Your king, sound the conch. Let triumph ring. No all. Oh, my is owner of 50 red feathers, master of 400 fat hogs. He can command a thousand fighting men or 20 strong-armed women to pump him to sleep. <laughs> Except from mighty George, our sovereign lord, in sign of British love, this British sword. Poor Mai, a doomed figure who's fallen between two cultures. Among the useless presents the British have given him, a suit of armor. He'll become an object of ridicule. Such is the strange nature of human affairs that we left him in a less desirable situation than he was in before his connection with us. James Cook knows his trip to England was a cruel experiment. Within the year, Mai will be broke and dead. My home was only ever a cover for this voyage. Cook's real goal was to find the prized Northwest Passage. But Cook lingered in the islands for four months. Even his officers started to wonder what was going on. It just doesn't add up. From an early age, Cook had methodically set himself goals and clinically carried them out. Now he was stalling when he had every reason not to. He knew success could give him everything he wanted, a knighthood, a place in society, the lion's share of that £20,000. A big incentive for a former farm boy. It takes James Cook and the expedition's two ships three months to sail from tropical Tahiti to the North American continent. Then make his way up to the icy waters of New Albion by the spring of 1778. This is where he now begins his search for the Northwest Passage. New Albion includes what we now call Canada. Here, James Cook meets the Mawachat, the people of the deer, the first white men they've ever seen, his visit will change their lives forever. To meet the descendants of the very Marchat who met James Cook. 
Ray and Terry Williams have a moving story to tell. It seems there were misunderstandings from the start. Uh, when they went out to meet him, they told him to circle the island. They told him to not shit. That means circle the island. And that's how we got the name Nootka for the island. He thought they were trying to tell him that it's called Nootka. So this yeah. hilarious <laughs> modern name is based on a misunderstanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Captain Cook paintings from John Weber and from the time? Let me have a look. No, can let, you show us? Let me show you here. Mm. OK. These are the, the longhouses. Yeah. And the march up on the beach yeah. with the canoes. Yeah. That's resolution and discovery. Resolution and discovery. And then your people on the beach. So really very little changed mm. in the last 230 years. Cook is tired, but he seems to renew himself at Nutka. During the time I was at the village, the people received me very courteously. Everyone pressing me to go into his house, and there spread a map for me to sit down upon and show me every mark of civility. Many of them are decorated with images. These are nothing less than the trunks of very large trees with the front carved into a human face and variously painted so that the all is a truly monstrous figure. James Cook likes it here. I think it's a relief from the never-ending pressure on board. For a short while, anyway, he seems to regain his better temper. His crew records the local language and starts trading with the chief of the Mawachat, Maquinna. When you had Maquinna and Cook, they were clearly treating each other as respected mm -hmm. individuals, as equals. Mm -hmm. Chief Maquinna and his people were trading uh, for, for nails, hammers, for, for muskets, for uh, mirrors, for, for anything that was very useful and valuable for Makuna's people. And Makuna traded, you know, with uh, uh, land otter and sea otter pelts and uh, mink, mink pelts and uh, raccoon pelts. And uh, that was the trade. He, he, he done it in a, in a business-like manner. Cook's visit paves the way for a booming fur trade in Nootka. But the European contact will be devastating for the Mawachat. Who introduced the booze to our people? The booze, the alcohol. The booze, the alcohol, and made our men drunk and uh, syphilis, gonorrhea, the disease that they had brought. That's how come our, a lot of our people started dying so young because of the the disease they had, not realizing it was killing them. Smallpox, influenza, venereal disease, these are the kinds of diseases that Europeans uh, brought to the Pacific. On the northwest coast, for example, it's estimated that at least one third of indigenous peoples died due to a smallpox epidemic. Indeed, it's hard for us to appreciate just how devastating that was. Ray and Terry's words are painful but not surprising. Cook knew he was bringing destruction to the people he met. We know this too. He wrote it in his journals. That knowledge would now have been eating away at his soul. Just imagine how profoundly isolated that would have made him feel. Captain Cook would sometimes relax from his almost constant severity of disposition and condescend now and then to converse familiarly with us. But it was only for the time. As soon as we entered the ships, he became again the despot. James Trevenon, midshipman, HMS Resolution. There are other problems as well. James Cook's ship Resolution is really falling apart. Sloppy defence contractors aren't just a modern problem. The shipwrights back home have done a terrible job, and he now needs to chop down these trees to replace masts and make new timbers. All work that should have been overseen by Cook in London, not thousands of kilometres away here. Did Cook lose control? Towards the end of the third voyage, certainly he was very tired. 
Um, he was almost certainly ill as well, though we don't know quite what caused the illness. One theory is, is that he was afflicted by an intestinal parasite which leached vitamin B from his system and caused behavioural changes. My own feeling is that Cook more likely had tuberculosis of the small bowel, which was quite common in those days. After a month in Nootka, James Cook sails off in search of the Northwest Passage. It's the start of his last great quest. Cook ships crawl along the tortuous Alaskan coastline. Every bay and inlet must be methodically checked. Any of them might reveal the elusive route to England. Weeks and months drift by. There's no sign of Cook's prize, no sign of a quick route home. Cook should have been in his element. On previous journeys, his obsession with meticulous charting of unfamiliar coastlines had driven his crew to distraction. But now it was doing the same to him. One huge bay alone took 16 days to explore to his satisfaction. Could it be he was starting to doubt himself? What if the Northwest Passage didn't really exist? What if this last great voyage was a waste of time? In August 1778, resolution and discovery pass through the Bering Strait and enter the Arctic Ocean. The two ships beat drums and fire guns to keep track of each other. Here, James Cook enters a world shrouded in fog. The Russian maps he's gathered in London are useless. What could induce him to publish so erroneous a map? But the most illiterate of his illiterate seafaring men would have been ashamed to put his name to. James Cook's behavior is beginning to horrify his men. He runs with the wind in fog so thick they can barely see the length of the ship. Suddenly, he hears the sound of crashing surf and orders the ship halted. When the fog clears, they realize they've hurtled through a gap in the rocks little wider than the ship herself. Providence had conducted us through these rocks where I should not have ventured on a clear day. And to such an anchoring place, I could not have chosen better. Providence? Fellow captain and friend Charles Clark was more ironic. Very nice pilotage, considering the perfect ignorance of our situation. Charles Clark, Captain HMS Discovery. Desperate for fresh meat, James Cook has some walrus butchered and orders his men to eat it. They find walrus disgusting and refuse. In a fit of pique, he cuts their rations. That's completely out of character for him and shows just how badly he was losing the control, the respect of his crew. That's something that's never happened before. They now take the extraordinary step of writing him a letter of complaint. It stopped him in the Antarctic and now it's stopping him again. James Cook has taken an 18th century wooden ship and its crew to the extremes of the earth, 70 degrees south and north. Now even the world's greatest explorer has to admit defeat. James Cook probably would have seen it as a failure of science. But perhaps it was a failure of the man. Perhaps he shouldn't have agreed to lead this voyage. He was almost 50. He'd spent most of the last 10 years at sea under the sort of pressure that most captains never experience. When he was younger, he seemed to thrive on this. But now it was taking its toll. Where once he led solely by example, now he would sometimes resort to using fear and threats. He was losing the respect of his crew and officers and the people he met in these new lands. James Cook is beaten. With the northern winter looming, it'll be months before he can search again for the Northwest Passage. He desperately needs somewhere warm to rest and resupply. 
So he takes his two ships back to the Pacific, to a place he discovered on his journey north, the Sandwich Islands. Today, we know the Sandwich Islands as Hawaii. Amazingly, Cook now sails round them for six weeks without landing. Their crew think their commander is out of his mind. They certainly are, watching this land pass by day after day. Cook offers no explanation, and they don't dare ask. Finally, resolution and discovery enter the wide bay and drop anchor. You still enter Kealakakua Bay the way James Cook saw it, but the reception he received was astonishing. So many people came out and clambered aboard Resolution and Discovery that both ships started to list. I had nowhere in the course of my voyages seen so numerous a body of people assembled at one place. Besides those in canoes, all the shore were covered in spectators and many hundreds were swimming about the ships like shoals of fish. Cook's amazed to find out he can speak with these people. They're Polynesians, the same people he's seen in Tahiti and across the Pacific. How should we account for this nation spreading itself so far over this vast ocean? We find them from New Zealand to the south, to these islands to the north, and from Easter Island to the Hebrides. Must be Gordon. Yes, how are you? I'm good, thank nice you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Oh, mm. thank you very much. Gordon Lesler's family have lived in Kealakakua Bay you. for centuries. They were here at the time of Cook. Even now, there's a belief that the Hawaiians greeted James Cook as the god Orono. However, the truth, as it often is, is a lot more interesting. When he landed on shore, it is said that the lesser chiefs that were here when they went to greet Captain Cook on a beach that prostrated before him on the ground and said Orono, Orono, Orono and that was interpreted to be by them that our people thought he was Orono. That was just protocol. They, they do that protocol in many parts of the world today. If a high-ranking dignitary arrive in some cultures today, they still go down and prostrate before them. So that was our, our culture. Clearly, we can't really know what the truth is, but it does seem to me to be a little bit of a European c conceit to think that uh, Europeans were always viewed as gods. That's simply not the case. One of the first things Cook does is to send his ship's master, William Bly, ashore to look for water and supplies. from the accounts of James Cook and his men, that this is the spot where William Bly stepped ashore to find water. Now, two centuries have left their mark on this beach. In Cook's day, all this would have been a huge expanse of sand. And just up here was a large village. Now, William Bly went past this village to go and find that water. You can see that the village has pretty much gone, but remarkably, the watering place itself is still here. Well, they're now reduced to a pretty slimy pond. But even more surprising is what's just over here. This massive stone building is a heiau, a sacred place, a temple. James Cook describes being brought here in his last ever journal entry. From this moment on, it's up to others to pick up the story. We were conducted by Kor to the top of this pile. At the entrance, we saw two large wooden figures with features violently distorted. Captain Cook was seated between two wooden idols. Kor and Perea began to pull the flesh off a hog in pieces and to put it into our mouths. I had no objection to be fed by Perea, who was very cleanly in his person. But Captain Cook, who was served by Koa, could not swallow a morsel. And his reluctance was not diminished when the old man, according to his own mode of civility, had chewed it for him. James King, Lieutenant, HMS Resolution. 
After almost three weeks, resolution and discovery resupply and leave. James Cook's going back again to hammer away at the ice at the Northwest Passage. But just a few days out of here, resolution breaks a mast. It's that shoddy workmanship he never ever saw in London coming back to haunt him. The ships have to return. This time, there's no big welcome. The Hawaiians have already given James Cook everything they have. They're far from happy to see the ships return. So what Cook does is pretty much hoover up all of their food and stores and sets off. And having paid him to go, the Hawaiians are obviously a bit upset to find that he comes back pretty much straight away. The Hawaiians make it very plain that their patience is worn thin. The level of thefts goes up very considerably. And this is a sign that the chiefs no longer are protecting him. It's the 14th of February, 1779. James Cook awakes to learn that during the night, one of his ship's boats has been stolen. The events of the day now move very fast. He orders the bay to be blockaded. Discovery on that side of the bay sealing it. Resolution sealing the other side. James Cook has decided to pick a fight. To the water's edge amid a gathering crowd of Hawaiians. Hundreds on this beach and more lining the rocks. To their eyes, James Cook's behavior is a huge insult. On the other side of the bay, William Bly, ever aggressive, orders his men to open fire on a canoe trying to breach the blockade. They kill a high-ranking warrior. A tidal wave of anger then sweeps along the shoreline. The beach erupts into volley of stones. James Cook himself fires the first shot, killing a man. Then the Hawaiians attack. It's nine in the morning, and it's over. James Cook, the world's greatest explorer, is dead. A silence ensued throughout the ship, it appearing to us somewhat like a dream. Grief was visible in every countenance, some expressing it by tears. All our hopes centered on him. Our loss became irreparable. George Gilbert, Midshipman, HMS Resolution. James Cook died right here, the sailors watching helplessly as his body is hacked to pieces. But what actually killed Cook wasn't daggers or stones or drowning. It was the belief that he could control every situation. That's the tragedy of his death his needless, pointless, stupid death. But that version of history doesn't make legends. The British Empire had other plans for Captain James Cook. James Cook is transported to heaven by Britannia. She likes her heroes dead. It makes them easier to control. Beside her, fame reaches forward to crown him with laurels. The crew get back what's left of James Cook. A small bag of body parts, his scalp, some flesh from his thigh, his jawbone, feet and both hands. The right one recognizable by that scar. The pieces of James Cook are then buried at sea. A fitting end for a man whose life was shaped by the sea. Uncomfortable on land, he created his own world aboard his ship, leaving his past, his class, and his grieving family behind for a world he thought he could control. It'll be a year before his wife, Elizabeth, finds out. She's making James a waistcoat from Tahitian cloth. It can only be for James's audience with the king.
the audience where he'll receive his knighthood and she'll become a lady. She'll be a widow for the next 56 years. Near the end of her life, at the age of 93, she burns all of James's letters, every one of them. We have no idea what was in them or why she did it, but I think she wanted to keep James Cook, the man, her husband, the father of her children, for herself. But ironically, in doing so, she made sure that only the myth would remain. Elizabeth had always been strong and determined, just like her husband. What little evidence we have about her suggests she was resourceful and stoic to the end of her long life. With no one to carry his personal story forwards, history could make what it wanted of James Cook. My journey in search of James Cook, the man behind the myth, ends right here on this beach in Hawaii. What I've found is perhaps an unpalatable truth, that the ambitious, decent man who saw the human in everyone, that man lost himself along the way. So, a genius, yes, but a flawed and lonely genius. And it's precisely those flaws, the madness, the violence, that made his true story more honest, more tragic. We don't need to whitewash our heroes. James Cook is still the greatest explorer this world has ever known. And the truth is even more powerful than the myth.